evaluations and observability. Um, so LLMs have sort of taken the world by a storm this year. And as a company, we have been focusing on AI quality in, in general. And obviously, in the beginning, we were fo focusing more on tabular data, then moved on to the NLP world, and now the LLM. So today, I want to talk, talk a little bit about how do you do LLM evaluations? Because they're very different, obviously, from the tabular world. Uh, the tabular world has a very classic, like it hasn't changed in 60s or 70s almost, where you're building classical models, you have a training data, you have labels, uh, you build your models, you have very established ways of evaluating whether this model is good enough or not. Um, sim for NLP, some things changed, but people still adapted, right? They had these uh, different ways of still measuring. For every use case, you had a different way of measuring the accuracy, but the old metrics still held. But when it came to LLMs, they're pretty much doing tasks which are much, mo which are almost, uh, which are very difficult to get labeled data for. So how do you do evaluations in this scenario is what most of the talk is going to be about. So let me start a little bit um, uh, with a little bit of a, almost an outlandish take uh, on LLMs, uh, where say this is, this is a chat GPT, like I asked this question to chat GPT where um, I was just asking who are the founders of of my company. And it did get the first, the first one is right, Anupam Datta is the founder, but the other two persons, I have never heard of them. I mean, at least I don't know them. And that was the answer I got from, uh, from chat GPT. In the beginning, obviously GPT-4 is much better, but, um, so which is why I always, like we as, a, we as a company say that consider whatever applications that are using LLMs to be hallucinatory, unless proven otherwise. Like start with this assumption that they are hallucinatory. Hallucinatory is, means nothing but like the usual English meaning, but slightly modified, it's become quite popular in this world where whenever the, app, the LLM application is giving you answers that are not at all relevant or, or incorrect answers, that's when we call them hallucinations. So start with this assumption, just to be safe. Now, why does this happen, right? Like why are LLMs hallucinatory? So these LLMs in general, whatever research is happening, they're optimized for generalization, which is why GPT does a great job, or not just, when I, uh, when I say GPT, I mean most LLMs actually, not just GPT-4s, the llamas or bards or whatever, they are meant to be, gen which is why, uh, they're meant to generalize, which is why they are obviously so popular, because it, it, will it replace Google, will it, can it, it can do all most of my summarization tasks, it can write my, um, it, write, it can write my marketing copy for me, it can give me, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because it's trying to do so many different things and it's generalizing so much, it by nature has to actively penalize memorization. Because otherwise it's then, I guess, it's almost like overfitting in the old world, but think of it as if it could do really, it could do one particular task really well, then it probably won't generalize very well. And this goes, uh, it's, um, it's almost natu it follows uh, naturally. Now this overlap is where it starts getting a bit murky. And this is where most people are playing now. But you have these models. These models themselves have real world use cases. You probably have heard a bunch of them today itself, right? Uh, but when you're building these use cases, you're trying to make them do a certain set of sub 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 certain subset of tasks. And you want them to get really, really good at them. Which is where this, jo this, uh, whole, this new framework, which I'm gonna uh, talk about in a second, starts making us do something like this, where you leave the generalization part of it to the LLM, whatever LLM you have, you're using, but the memorization part, you keep it to yourself. You do the memorization, so you, sorry. So, memorization, so, so, so what, what, is, what, is, what are some general tasks that LLMs are good at? Stuff like summarization, so if you have like a bunch of articles and you want to give a good, nice summary for it, yeah, LLMs are perfect for it. If you have some sort of a, text embedding that you want to understand, you can ask LLMs for it. If you want to do some sort of inference or planning, like give it a bunch of tasks and ask it, give it some parameters, it'll set it up for you. But the pieces that you're giving it is what we call memorization and leave that to something else. Don't leave that to the LLM. So for that, for the memorization piece, for these LLMs, you will need some sort of knowledge sources, right? And that's where these vector databases like Pinecone, 
et cetera, where you are setting up your own knowledge bases. Like for example, uh, Airtel has, is trying to do some sort of a chatbot, and then they have a bunch of, they have, obviously they have a bunch of data from the years and years of customer service that they have been providing, and that data is a gold mine that can be then, that, that can give you this memorization pieces, which can then be sent to the LLM to get, uh, to give you, to give much better answers than just in general trying to use an LLM. Or you could have agents. Agents are basically nothing but some sort of tools that you can use for, uh, for querying the, out, the data that's out there already. That's like stuff like Reddit, um, uh, your uh, Twitter or X now, whatever, archive, etc. Right, so one of these two things are needed for ha handling the memorization piece, which is this data is already exists somewhere. Let's try to get that data and then send it to the LLM. That's where these, these, this new, uh, this concept has become quite popular, which is the RAGs, right? Um, which is retri retrieval augmented general generation, where what you do is if a, if, the, if a user has asked a question, which could be obviously to a customer service, age, uh, as a customer service bot, or to a, or uh, in general, some sort of a internet query that the user is using. Once they ask that question, don't directly hit the LLM. First, obviously convert it into an embedding because that's how, that's how machines understand text. Send that embedding to your vector database or your agents. Retrieve some sort of chunks that can then, uh, that, that are relevant to the query. None of this is, this could be an LLM, honestly, but I'm just saying that there's something, some other piece of intelligence that's doing that, which is retrieving contexts that are relevant to the query uh, from your vector database or your op open source tools. And then with this query plus the relevant chunks, you send it to, uh, to some sort of an LLM that can then generate that response that you want to send to the user. And there are, this is obviously the most simplest version of a rag. Obviously this can get a lot more complicated where you might want uh, you might have multiple LLMs of different places, depending on how complex your task is, this can get, you want it to iterate a bit, hey, why don't you improve your answer, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. But rags, unfortunately, can also hallucinate. So you, uh, at the same question, this Shayak is the other co-founder that it didn't find in my first example. So this time what I did was, uh, I, instead of directly using an LLM, we used a rag where we used our intern, his, uh, where we use the internal co-founders articles that we have written on our website, took relevant chunks from that, and then sent that to the LLM, um, and then tried to ask the same question, who is Shaq? It started doing better, like some of it it got right, he's a computer scientist who obtained his PhD from so-and-so university, um, and he has been building systems and leading research, but then he started talking about, he, he's also a member of Bank of England, which again, as far as I know, is not. So, so these can also hallucinate. Which is why, which is why this is not enough. Like just say call, you started, we just, because you've started using rags, doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't, doesn't obviate the need of needing LLMs, sorry, evaluation of LLMs. Now who are the people facing this problem? Like Gen AI is obviously taking over the world, but some of the early adopters that we are seeing are falling into these two camps. Uh, people who are just building pool prototypes, which does the job, job about 70, 80% of the time, and gets, generates a lot of excitement, Right, getting it 80% of the time is a high number, but you cannot deploy it in production with 80% of the time. It's working only 80% of the time. So it's much harder to go beyond that is where, where we are seeing people, where, where we are seeing people face this uh, challenge in how do we deploy this to production. And these, cam th these camps generally fall into these kinds of people, like usually EdTech is where we have seen some of these use cases. And then there is the customer support, uh, which the example that I was just talking about and some financial services where they want to build a customer facing chatbot, et cetera, that's using some sort of knowledge base that the financial companies have generated, which is specific to them, which is not publicly available. So these, so, th so how do we move on from here? And that's where the systematic iteration piece starts coming into play, where we need to improve LLM apps, both in development and in production, but we first need to, make sure that they are built well before they can go to production. And that's when, like, we are a technology company. I'm sure most of us here are, te are technologists. Whenever there's a problem, most of the time, we try to look at platform-based solutions. And any Gen AI observatory platform should have these three pieces, which is, um, they should be able to, you should be able to evaluate them, 
with a, with a broad app support. Reliably and compre comprehensibly have a comprehensible extensible evaluations. When, as you're doing these evaluations, you should be able to track them. And why are you tracking them? Because you want to obviously pick the best one whenever you're doing any experiments to deploy to production. And once it's in production, you should be able to monitor them, which is highly scalable, cost effective, and low latency. And whenever you find issues in production, a typical uh, a loop so that it can go back and make your evaluations better. Because anytime you learn something new, some new scenario that you never thought of while evaluating, you see that in production, there should be a very easy way of making that into an evaluation or a test or whatever that you want to run for your next version of the model. Now this seems, this sound, sounds very similar and very, uh, like very first principles based logic. And because most machine learning works like this, like not just LLMs, even the tabular world or NLP world has very similar beats to it, right? Like when you're developing models, you're trying to evaluate it based on some sort of accuracy scores um, and then you, you, you want to obviously make a model registry where you're tracking all your models and then as you're going to production, you want to monitor them at scale and whenever there are issues, you can get your feedback in into your next version. So th that philosophy remains the same actually. Like it doesn't matter whether you're using LLMs or um, LLMs or any other model, but the, the way you do the evaluations changes and because of this world, the amount of information and data and models in this case, where before models used to be in-house, now models are not in-house, they are being hosted by other third parties which, and which are, which, for which you have programmatic access. One of the key pieces that any platform that's built needs to have is easy integration with the, with, the, with the rest of the tech stack that's coming. And it needs to be highly dynamic, it needs to evolve. Every month you're gonna hear of a new model that's coming out, um, like, uh, and like two weeks ago, OpenAI themselves released their own SDK, uh, which kind of changed the entire um, entire game of what Lang Langchain was trying to do, et cetera. Like stuff like that is gonna keep happening. So it needs to be very agile when they are, whenever you're building an observability pro platform. And that's where um, we have a product called TrueLens, but I don't wanna talk about the product specifically that much. I'm gonna talk more about the philosophy behind how we use the product, but this is an open source product that our company has put out. And I mean, we started it, obviously, now it's an open source product. There are a bunch of contributors from outside the company as well. Um, where what we are trying to help do with this package is, it's a Python package, very easy to install and to get going, is as you're doing your LLM experiments, building your applications, et cetera, you should be able to do these three main things in the SDK. So this is not supposed to, like, um, in the previous slide I was talking about an entire platform. This is not an entire platform, this is just one piece of it, where it will let you build your LLM application, connect your LLM application to uh, some sort of a logging mechanism, that logs all your experiments and then define feedback functions. Like, what are feedback functions? I'll get into them in a second. And the evaluations of those feedback functions will be stored inside a dashboard. That's at a very high level. That's what the that's what the that's what the package is about. And the the goal of this uh, application is again, as I was saying, one thing we were al always wanted to make sure is whatever solution we build, we build or anyone else build where we contribute has to have a broad app support. Like it needs to work on rags, it needs to work on agents, it needs to work on the fine tuning experiments. Some people fine tune the model by trying to overfit it to their own use case, uh, whatever it is. And it also should uh, integrate with the leading frameworks like the Llama indexes, Langchains, uh, Pinecones, et cetera, which gives you a very nice language to build your own applications. So in a, in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell, what it d lets you do is when you're building, using Langchain or whatever to build an application, you just insert a couple of lines of code and we start, la uh, which, which lets you uh, connect it to, uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to, to our product and then you can start defining your feedback functions and the evaluations, et cetera. But what are those is more interesting for this talk than the product itself. You guys can check out the product later. And which is, the heart of it is how do you do these evaluations, right? Uh, it's all, um, because as I said in the beginning, if you don't have like a golden source of truth uh, or a label that you can test against. But what you can test against is even if you don't have the golden source of truth is some sort of a score that a feedback function can give while reviewing your LLM apps inputs and outputs and the intermediate results. And principally speaking, whenever it's responding to someone, we need it to be honest, harmless and helpful. These are pretty, uh, simple human emotions that all of us understand. And we need our agents to do the same, uh, we need our models to do the same thing. So how do you test for honesty? 
you can test for answers relevance. There are relevance models out there that you can give two pieces of text and tells you whether it's relevant or not. You can do this embedding distance uh, because embedding is just the numerical form of the text. You can see how far off it is from what are the question uh, what, what, what questions were being asked. Like for example, you were asking about the Cricket World Cup and it started responding about the rugby. You, that when you go into the embedding space, these are very different. It has very different text. So it, the distance will be very high. Context relevance. Uh, which basically, what is the difference between context and answer is answer is the final answer. Context is what I was talking about where you use some sort of an intelligence to bring in some sort of context that's then given to the LLM model. So you can do context relevance as well. You can do groundedness where you try to see the context was given about football, uh, sorry, about cricket, but the answer is about rugby. That means at least till the context part you were right. Something went wrong when, when, when it was sent to the LLM. So there, then you can start figuring out whether I should be changing my LLM or I should be changing my whatever I'm doing for building, for finding this context in from my internal databases or external databases and some customization evaluations. Now when it comes to harmless, um, harmless is more typical, um, our typical tech world which is like we don't want PII to be leaking uh, from your external database obviously then it doesn't become, it's not PII but uh, at least from internal databases, none of the PII should be going out in answers. Uh, so for that detection of that, there are a bunch of agent, uh, models out there. Or you could build, train your own model looking for sp specific pieces. Uh, toxicity, again, it's very, uh, it's very easy to have, because you don't control the LLM. It's most of the time someone else that's giving it. You don't know how it's trained and what sort of triggers it's going to start, uh, end up, uh, what sort of triggers the LLM to give you toxic responses instead of helpful responses stereotyping, jailbreaks, and then obviously there's always custom evaluations that you that could be typical to your own use case. And finally, helpful. Whether is it uh, giving you, the, the, is, the, is the prompt sentiment good? Um, is, the, is there a language mismatch? So you ask a question in English, it should ideally respond in English, otherwise it's not very helpful even if it's the right answer. Um, is it concise? It's not rambling for like pages and pages for a very simple question, and stuff like that, right? These are the kinds of evaluations that we want to, we want to enable users to have. And obviously TrueLens is one of the examples. There are other products out there as well in open source world which you can use for doing something like this. Um, but that's the idea. You, want, you should be testing along these lines. There's no such thing as was this, the answer, was this the right answer? That's very hard to do. But you can answer questions like was this helpful? Was it, was it, was it honest in the sense, is it at least relevant to what it's talking about? Is it giving harmful information out there which it shouldn't be giving, et cetera? Those kinds of things. The second part of, part of it, if you guys remember, was tracking these experiments. Once evaluate, you have track, right? Now, how do you track these experiments? This is classic dashboarding. Like for every experiment, every application that you're building, make sure these evaluations are being, uh, being measured at an aggregate where uh, you have some sort of, uh, this is the screenshot of the TrueLens app, but again, nothing special here. It's just every application which each row, each row has how much money has this app cost you? What, what is the context relevance to it? Or what is the, in general, of the, all the different feedbacks that you have, each column represents a feedback function that you, are, you have uh, configured your app to have. And at an aggregate, what's the feedback score for it? Uh, for, all the, for all the inputs it has re received so far, right? So pretty straightforward. And then once you have this, you can pick your most optimal model based on whatever criteria you have. Hey, I need this more, I'm fine with the model having a slightly lower context relevance score, but as long as it's giving the final answer is right, I don't care. That could be your approach, or you could have other approaches where you'd be like, no, I need the entire app to be perfect because the use case is very sensitive, like healthcare or whatever, so we need the entire app to work well. So depending on your use case, you can choose your optimal model. So then the game becomes now finally, is how do we choose the right evaluation? Because there are obviously many evaluations I, I, which I was talking about, like the helpful, harmful, and, um, uh, and honest. So there, these are the different kinds of evaluations. First is traditional NLP evaluations, which is uh, nothing but the, okay, let me start from bottom then. The ground truth evaluations, which is um, you have a right answer, which is very hard to collect at scale, but it is possible in some cases. So if, uh, the x-axis is basically how meaningful it will be and y-axis is how scalable it will be. So ground truth eval is obviously the most meaningful because there's a human sitting there and telling you whether the answer that uh, the LLM gave me is right or not. But it's also the least scalable because of it depends on the person. Uh, sorry, ground truth is when it's written by the human, it's already there in the system, but it doesn't scale because you can't keep writing them. 
human evaluation, when there's literally a person sitting there and evaluating every response. Uh, then there is the traditional NLP evaluations, which I was talking about, such as the blue and the root scores that you have, uh, that tells you whether the, um, whether the text that you have is matching the other text or not, et cetera. The pretty standard scores that Hugging Face has made it popular, but it's been there for a while. But these are too syntactic. Like they're literally looking for words. So sometimes the semantic meaning of it can get lost. Then you have the M MLMs, which is like large language, the mass models that like birds of the world, in which you have an incomplete sentence and ask it to fulfill the sentence, etc., which can be fine-tuned to provide the right feedback uh, for answering one of the some of the questions. Like it can tell you very well whether the relevance is fine or not, etc. And finally, the LLM evals. So you can take what you can do is you can take an LLM, take its response, and ask the LLM itself, do you think this is a relevant answer or not? So these are LLM evals. They have a, they obviously have a strong agreement sometimes with human evals, but also these are very expensive because every LLM call is going to cost you something. So the goal of this slide to, to tell you was there are multiple evaluations that you could be doing. There is no right answer. Some are scalable, but maybe not that meaningful. Some are meaningful and scalable, but expensive. Uh, some are, some need a lot of fine tuning and some are obviously no brainers, but very hard to scale. So you need to pick a combination of these is the idea. And depending on your use case, you need to be able to have a basket of these and then run them every time. So that's, uh, so that's what, um, so that's, that's in a, in a basket, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, that's how you should think about evaluating your LLMs. And when you're evaluating these LLMs, uh, you should, Okay, I'm gonna skip through these slides because it's mostly talk about talking about my company's product. Where I'm not trying to, I'm not here for marketing the product. So I'm gonna skip those slides. But in general, the idea is going back to the same platform requirement is you should have some way of evaluating the LLM, tracking it and monitoring it once it goes to production. Obviously monitoring, finding an open source solution for monitoring is gonna be difficult. Uh, you will have to probably go for an enterprise solution uh, because I mean, when you go put something in production, it's really hard to, uh, obviously, there are some successful cases where you might want to use uh, scalable solutions, uh, which are secure. But big, like for example, at least financial companies and a lot of enterprise companies, it's really hard to convince them to use an, an open source solution for it, because you need to not only guarantee s scale but also guarantee security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at least evaluation and tracking is a no-brainer. You should be doing it, uh, either using an open source tool or in-house tools, etc. Thinking about it in the way I was, was talking about. So now, till now, I've, I've, I've been primarily talking about at a high level how, do, how these evaluations happen. Now let's take an example, it's slightly more dig deeper into how would you evaluate a, a RAG, right? Um, a RAG is again nothing but retrieval augmented generation where you have a query, query is the first, for the query you first go and find some sort of a context from your internal database and then send it to LLM or whatever and get a response. Now, the first thing you want to look at is the first arrow there where for the, there's something called context relevance. Now what is context relevance? For the query, is the retrieved context relevant to the query or not? So say, for just to continue with the cricket example, if the question was who won the, okay, that shouldn't be talking about who won the World Cup, I guess, but let's talk about who won the 2011 World Cup. And then if the, if the context first thing that needs to be coming out is cricket is a sport, uh, it's played between whatever so-and-so countries, it was hosted in India, it, India won it, Dhoni hit the last six, etc. All those are relevant context, right? Um, as long as that is coming, you're good. But if you're getting something else, then the context relevance is a problem. Second is groundedness. Groundedness being the final response that was sent to the user, was that supported by the context or not? So with all the relevant pieces we just had, was the final response India won the World Cup with Dhoni hitting the winning runs? Is that the answer? Then you're good. But if it, talks, if it talks about Australia winning the World Cup in 2023, then you know that the answer, even though the answer is right, but it is not supported by the context. So it's not a grounded, the, so the grounded evaluation should fail for it. And finally, the answer relevance, where uh, you see, you might get all of this right, but if the answer is itself not relevant to the query, then, uh, is the, then it's, it's pointless, right? So this is what we call the rag triad, where uh, whenever you're evaluating your rags, you should be thinking about it like this. At least these three feedback functions should be there. You can have a bunch of other ones regarding toxicity, language mismatch, all those are, a bunch of other um, subsequent, I think we be in our, in our open source package itself, we have like 15 or 20 of these feedback functions that you could use for configuring. But these three should be there for any RAG uh, because without this, you're not getting the entire picture of how your RAG is functioning. 
Now, just to give an example again, um, is for the who is shy question, at the bottom, those four lines that you're seeing are the different pieces of context that were retrieved by the, by the model, that, that by the application. First two were fine, where it was talking about when Shayak started production grade, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. It's basically talking about his undergrad, uh, um, what he was doing during his undergrad. But finally, the last two were talking about how he became the chief data officer at Ch Standard Chartered Bank, et cetera. So the context relevance should fail for this, this record. Like this is for this record. These feedback functions work for each record, like each input that the query is. So some, so your, it could happen that your application is doing well on some sort of questions, but doing poorly on some sort of questions. Now that's also very insightful for you. So you could know that, hey, my application doesn't work in certain type, certain scenarios, so maybe for I shouldn't be using an LLM application. Whenever I get these kind of questions, it's better to respond saying, hey, don't uh, don't use an LLM app. You please send it to a human agent or something. Next uh, next example of this would be um, someone ask, hey, is this room service? May I help you, et cetera. It's like it's an entire conversation regarding room service, et cetera. And there, you, the question that the, the question that is being uh, the question that people are asking is it why are you taking so long to uh, rush the, like get me my order? And the context that the, that was given to them was this some sort of a uh, they need an like they need additional 15 minutes to arrive, so et cetera, et cetera. But the response that we are giving is uh, is not is. Uh, they will take additional 15 minutes for their order to arrive. They are not happy about that, so they have no other option but to wait. But that's not what the context is telling them. The context is telling them that they're happy to wait, et cetera, as long as the order is made well, right? So in that case, you had some context pieces that is not being used by your response for some reason, either because the LLM is not equipped to answer these kinds, uh, equip, equip, equipped to ha handle these kinds of texts. But, uh, but whatever is the reason, maybe, at least like evaluation should fail so that you at least know then you can have other options and maybe you should remove the GPT model and put a Llama V2 model or whatever it is. And finally, whether the answer itself uh, 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 is <laughs> relevant, where the question was asked was which year was the Hawaii skate song written and the answer was Hawaii, which obviously again doesn't make any sense. So th th this is the obviously the most obvious one where the answer should be relevant to the question. But, and this I think most people do. It's the other two where people sort of falter sometimes. Right? So that's, those are the, so that's a, just an example of how a RAG itself should be evaluated and um, overall how should, how should you be thinking about evaluations of in general any LLM applications, but specifically for RAG, these three, plus obviously you have other toxicity, PII, et cetera, et cetera, those kind of language mismatches, those should be there, cost tracking, et cetera. And the most important thing is these feedback functions should be able to run on any kinds of models. So these are the most popular logos today in the Llama V2 world. Uh, the Hugging Faces, uh, OpenAI, obviously, Azure, uh, Llama V2, Cohere, et cetera. And because of the way the current, the speed at which this ecosystem is evolving, you cannot tie down to a particular set of models or a particular set of frameworks, et cetera. You should be able to openly integrate with any of these. And finally, we should be able to run these evaluations on any of, not the, the, the first previous slide was models. These slides are the frameworks, like the Lang chains and Llamas, a llama index of the world, which lets you write these applications. So any feedback, whenever you're making an evaluation solution, either in-house or trying to evaluate any of the evaluation solutions that are out there, you should be looking at these parameters. It's how extensible it is, is it, how easily is it, um, how easily is it, um, uh, if tomorrow something new comes in, how easy would it be for me to change my system, et cetera. So that's pretty much it, that was my last slide. Um, we have about, two, I think, one and a half minutes. If anyone has any questions, happy to take them. Uh, hi, uh, hi, my name is Siddhant. I'm from Astuto. So I have a question for, for use cases which are more deterministic, for example, for generating SQL. Uh, other than having a labeled data set where you have the right query, how can we evaluate it in an unsupervised manner? For a deterministic set, again, I think the, the, the paradigm still works, right? Like whether you are being, you are, are you answering a relevant question or not? Are you answering um, uh, 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 whether whether I mean, I guess this won't be a rag. You will directly ask the yeah. LLM. Yeah. Uh, so in that situation, but I would in that case directly go for why would you need an uh, uh, unsupervised version? Because that's a very deterministic task. So they should have a right answer to it. But so how do we verify? We don't have all combinations of question and answers, right? We yeah. don't have that set. So how do we establish 
Yeah, so then that, in that case, you're going with, again, the typical, uh, whether the embedding space is right for the answer, whether it's at least giving you a syntactically right query, whether, it, whether but the, yeah. We, we, we can't we, establish the correctness of the query. You cannot establish the correctness of the query unless you can, you have some sort of a human way of telling, I mean, unless you want to write a unit test or something that tells you what the right answer is going to be. But what you could do is you could, again, see similar queries that have been asked in the past. Is this same enough, to, uh, like, is it in the, in the same ballpark as that, in the same embedding space as that? and uh, whether it's, um, and obviously the other things, which is syntax, syntax is right, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do LLM evaluations. You could take one model's response and give it to another model and ask it whether this is, a, this is the right, would you answer the same, is what I would ask. Like for example, if ChatGPT is giving me this answer, I would ask Lama V to the same question and compare the answer, the responses, et cetera, stuff like that. Obviously, this will be a bit more expensive. Okay, okay. Because you would, <laughs> yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah. We'll take one more question in the interest of time. Uh, hi, my name is Nipun. Are all the evaluation like context relevance and answer relevance we talked about, yeah. are those relevances uh, determined by like you ask another LLM to uh, do that evaluation for you? And then how do you make sure that evaluation itself is not a hallucination? Yeah, that's a good question. You could, yeah, that's one way to do it. One way is would, would be to do, uh, to use, la which is what that uh, this slide was talking about, which was, uh, I believe it was basically the x-axis, y-axis slide. So here, the LLM evals is basically what you just said, which is you take one evaluation response, but you could also use like a BERT model for it, where you would try to ask whether you take the answer, mask some of it, and give BERT to complete that answer and tell you does it give back the same answer or not, stuff like that. That's where that's how you would try to, like basically try to uh, try to evaluate the same answer in multiple ways. Thank you so much, Avinash, for taking the time and joining us out here and for that very insightful presentation.